So about five years ago, I was practicing piano one day, and I was watching the reflection of my hands on the fall board of the piano, and I had this thought of, wouldn't it be really lovely if instead of seeing my own hands there, I could see somebody else's hands? And that the piano could serve as a portal to somebody from far away, or perhaps even another time. So shortly after that, I started off as a graduate student at the MIT Media Lab in the Tangible Media Group, and I started trying to build this thing. Yamaha loaned me this piano for research, and so here I am in my office with a grand piano crammed in behind me. My desk chair is now the piano bench. During the day, I'm programming on my computer, and at night, I turn around and I play on the piano. So despite the superficial similarity between typing on the computer keyboard and playing on the piano keyboard, the two are worlds apart in terms of interaction and also frame of mind. As an undergrad at MIT, I study computer science, which is essentially the science of information systems, which seeks to encode the world as information that the computer can represent, manipulate, and store. A core tenant of computer science is this idea of abstraction. In other words, a way of describing things symbolically, of categorizing, procedurizing, extracting the salient content over the details. So this idea of abstraction isn't just for computers. It's a really powerful way that human beings make sense of the world intellectually. Suppose I told you that this morning I woke up at 6 a.m., came here for rehearsal, had some fruit for breakfast. I'm giving you an abstracted summary of my morning, skipping the vast sensory details of what had actually occurred. So at the end of the day, as human beings, we have to interact with the world and with our computers. And it's an interaction that keeping things as abstract information in the primarily analytical, intellectual, symbolic mode isn't the only way, nor is it always the best way. And that's because, as people, we interact with the world through embodied experience. Let me give you an example. Suppose you wanted to know about the weather. You could whip out your handy smartphone, open up your fancy weather app, read the temperature from the screen and look at the shining icon of the sun to form an idea in your head, or you could simply step outside and <laughs> feel the scorching hot sun on your face and maybe a little wind in your hair if you're lucky, and instantly get an idea of what it's like. Of course, your fancy smartphone can tell you things that going outside cannot, such as the temperature in another city, but going outside gives you a much richer, more immediate experience. So for the past few years at the Media Lab, I've been thinking about designing interactions with digital information to be more experiential. And for that, I'm looking to the way that humans experience music. And that's actually because music is really quite abstract, if you think about it. As sheet music, it's just notes on a page encoding information, which lends itself really well to intellectual analysis. But the abstract nature of music does not limit it to the intellectual mode. We never speak of music as just information. And moreover, I think that the very sparsity from the abstraction of music enables us to breathe life into it in a performance. So how do you do that? Here, I put on my hat as a pianist to tell you that the key is not just what you play, but how you play it. For one, it's deeply rooted in the physical. You've got to develop a finely tuned ear, not just for the correct notes with the correct rhythms, but more importantly, for things like tone and timing. And the playing itself must convey physical qualities, a sense of gravity, of movement, singing phrases, dancing beats that affirm a sense of being in the world. And then there is the invisible component. I, as the performer, must project my inner world, my imagination, my life experience, my feelings into what I play. And you, as the audience, must in turn project your inner world of imagination, life experience, and emotions into what you hear. Some of my favorite pieces to play are contrapuntal, like the fugues of Johann Sebastian Bach. Pieces with multiple voices that interweave and intertwine. Actually, to be honest, I first became drawn to these pieces intellectually. As a teenager, I would print out pages of sheet music and obsessively highlight them like this, trying to analyze the harmonies, the lines, the cadences. But while this piece can be understood in this way, 
it is also this. So this is an excerpt from Bach's C minor partita, played by Gwen Gould. Not quite a few, but you get the idea. As for me, it took me years to realize that while the intellectual mode cannot be ignored in music, it alone is not sufficient. For music must be in the body and come from the heart. So if you can indulge my computer science side for just a moment, and let's think about music as interaction with information, though of course it's much, much more than that. For almost the entirety of human history, music could only be heard in live performance, where it was intricately tied to the body of the performers. But with the invention of recording technology in the 19th century, we could now extract only the sound. Taking a slice of the performance to be listened to anywhere at any time, a pure type of listening that allows you to focus more on the content to the extent that Glenn Gould, whom you just heard, prophesied the demise of the live concert at the hands of the recording. But more than half a century later, the live concert is still, well, alive and thriving. And I'd like to think that there is something really powerful about the presence of the performer. So my project, Mirror Fugue, named for a special type of fugue by Bach, tries to bring the presence of the pianist back into the recording. So some of you might be thinking, well, why not just watch a video? It's way more convenient. There are plenty on YouTube. Don't have to go through all this effort. And, you know, convenience, usefulness, it's things that we usually talk about with digital information. But I'm here to tell you that after the years and iterations of working on this project, that it's not just about the availability and convenience of the streams of information, but how you put them together that fundamentally shapes the experience, which is what design is all about. But moreover, if you embed, if you embed digital information firmly in the physical world, if you engage multiple senses, if you create a feeling of space, and if you allow just a bit of, in just a bit, of room for the imagination to fill in the blanks. Something really magical happens where you no longer perceive it as streams of useful, convenient, available information, but as a coherent, present, visceral experience. So what could you do with this type of experience? Well, for one, you can listen to a concert by a great pianist from anywhere in the world. Lights, please. Can we turn off the lights here? Thank you. So you could sit in front, have an intimate perspective, and even learn how to play, not just the notes of the hands, but also the breathing, phrasing, and characterization of the person. That was a lovely performance by Donald Fox, my teacher and mentor, who's in the audience right now. Um, you could... <laughs> Not over yet, you could also play a duet with yourself like I did in the beginning, but what I really like to think about is what if you can play with yourself from the past? So, oh, this is Elisa, the daughter of my advisor Hiroshi Ishii. But let's just pretend for a few seconds that I am her, all grown up 20 years later. I can encounter myself at the piano. Sit in front of her and even play along. So, of course, you're not limited to playing duets with just yourself. You can play with anybody at any time, grandparents even, or when they're at your age. So, obviously, this is not my grandfather here, but some of you may recognize him as Marvin Minsky, also known as the father of artificial intelligence. What you may not know about Marvin is that he improvises contrapuntal music in the style of Bach, often fugues. So, in a fugue, you always have several voices. One may take the focus at different times, but the others are never ignored. I'd like to think of the fugue as a metaphor for music performance, for interaction, and also for life. So on one hand, you have the intellectual, the analytical. On another, you have the physical, the sensorial. And on a third hand, you have the inner world of imagination and emotion. 
And it is the intertwining of all three that deeply engages us and invites us in. So with that, I'd like to invite you in to one final performance. Um, it's the world premiere of the first piece arranged specifically for Mirror Fugue by Donnell Fox, whom you just heard, and we'll hear again along with jazz pianist and my good friend from childhood, Nick Sanders. <laughs> 